Hello, my name's Tom Walker. Welcome to That'll Be The Day. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking to a young, visually impaired musician who's very definitely making waves on the Irish music scene. But before we hear from Sean Harrington, if you like the music at the start of this podcast, it's a track called That'll Be The Day by the Liverpool band The Vow. And as always, I'll be featuring a track by the band at the end of this podcast. To find out which one it is, stay tuned. Now, there's nothing unusual about visually impaired musicians. I could probably name about 50 off the top of my head. But when I met Sean Harrington at the Irish Centre in Liverpool, I was struck by his talent, confidence and honesty. I enjoyed listening to Sean, as did the audience. I remember Dublin City in the Yes, I'm at a very lively Irish Centre in Liverpool, and with me is Sean Harrington. Um, Sean, how are you doing? I'm doing good, mate, thank you. Really good. Looking forward to the gig. I recall meeting you um, in April 2016, when uh, I was recording a piece for In Touch Hi. on the 150th anniversary of Worcester. Yeah, I, I, re- I recall that too. It was the uh, first time I think I'd ever had a uh, talk to anyone from... Uh, from podcasts to radio and stuff, and it was you were in touch at the time. You know? That's right, I was working for in touch. If I remember, you were clattering away on an old Perkins. Yeah, great. I used to hate those things. <laughs> Still do hate those things. Yeah. <laughs> Remind me of exams. Remind you of exams. Don't yeah. forget, forget those. Absolutely. Did the music start for you then at New College? Pretty much, yeah. Um, well, no, actually, it st- they really started. My granddad got me guitar lessons before I even went to New College, but. It really took off there because I had a fabulous guitar teacher and um, when you're away from home and some things get a bit tough and the best thing you can do to kind of clear your head a bit is just to um, it's just to write, you know, mess around and sit and play with your guitar and go up with lyrics and tunes and stuff and then learn songs that you love. So that's where I got into it, I think, on my own. And was it just the guitar or did you do other instruments as well? I, I mainly do guitar and vocals, but my... Ironically, in an Irish centre, the first instrument I learned, even before the guitar, when I was about eight or nine, and I still play, I learned the Bowron, the Irish drum, which uh, really teaches you a sense of rhythm, uh, which came in very handy for the guitar. So, uh, you know, that was the first instrument I've ever picked up, and I still play it. Um, sometimes I bust it out at a gig. Not tonight, I don't think, um, but sometimes I do, because it's a, it's a fabulous, very old instrument, older than most. So. Did you do the grades when you did the guitar as well? I did two or three, but I never liked grades. I've never, I've never liked exams of any kind. I've never liked the idea that someone can say to you, look, I've decided what you're going to learn in this subject. You're going to come in, you're going to sit and you answer every question the way we tell you and we're going to mark you on it and then we're going to decide how well you've done from that. I don't think education should be done like that. I think you should be educated for the sake of education in anything and for your own desire to learn, not for... Not for the desires of trying to tick every box out of, and so I, I, I didn't do grades because I, I don't know, I always felt slightly rebellious about it. When you were at New College Worcester, did you do many gigs either in college or in the town itself, in the city centre, I should say? Um, I played for the college a fair bit, especially in my last two years um, when I was developing, but, and I did, a fair f- I did a couple gigs, I did a few gigs in Worcester, uh, a few at a really nice wine bar I used to go to, but I was really setting out at that point. I started playing like open mics and stuff when I was about 17, so I left when I was 18, so there was about a year when I was playing a few gigs and open mics every week if I could get to them. When you were younger, did you, you know, perform? Were you the, 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 the entertainment for family dues and oh things God. like that? Oh, God, yeah. Um, my family are a very musical family. Well, they are in a way. That if you have any sen- any minor talent musically, and even if you don't, you have to perform, especially for my grandma. I love her, but it's it's like we if you if you could hold a tune, you were singing sort of. And uh, in some ways, that's very good to g- kind of get your confidence up. In some ways, it's like it can be kind of like a little tiresome. But you know, you, you if you love music itself, then it doesn't matter, you'll, you'll sing to yourself and that's that, so. And your grandma and granddad, Nora and Tom, they're here today as well, yeah, supporting they are, you. they are. Uh, they're here at a lot of my gigs, especially the Irish ones, obviously. Um, big Irish connections, so, so they come up with me from Leeds. And, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to have them. We've got them to thank for your musical talents. Um, you said you did your first open mic night when you were 17. That seems Very quite close. late. Was that was that a confidence thing, or did you just uh, did the opportunity just not present itself? 
the thought hadn't even crossed my mind that I was good enough or wanted to even properly kind of play music in front of people. Um, we're taught, especially you'll know yourself being visually impaired, that the one thing that most people should and can do is, you know, get good exam grades, get better exam grades, get even better exam grades, find a good university, go to university, do as the best you can in university, find a job, settle down. And that was kind of going through all my head through my GCSEs, and I think that's why I didn't do particularly well in them, because I've, in case you couldn't tell, I've never done particularly well with those kind of preformed expectations. And uh, with a blind college, it's even more enhanced, because the sad fact is, when you look at it statistically, far more there are far more employed blind people who were successful in exams and went to university than, than weren't, which means there is a, a, a big sort of pressure put on... Uh, by the fam by my family, uh, I think a little bit, and, and by the college, of course, to to do well, not because of not in any sort of controlling way, but because that's what is expected to to make you do well in life. You may not be academic, but you've got your music. And, and tell well, us exactly. about well, I was quite academic as well, but only as a result of that. I think I would have much rather spent my days noodling around on my guitar and writing more music than studying. Uh, the political state of the country, so... Tell me about your music, Sean. What, 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 you know, describe it for people who, who don't know you. My music is... I do all sorts to uh, these gigs, so I do Irish music, obviously. Um, but I do, I'm, my sort of genres that I specialise in for most gigs are blues, rock and roll, indie, folk, um, and my own music that I write is some sort of mix between all of it. I was going to say you write your own music as well. I do, um, we've uh, just finished the EP and we're just preparing to, um, we've just had a video made and we're getting another animated video done. Plug the EP, come on, tell us more. It's called, uh, it's called Dark Times, the EP. Dark Times EP and it's based off the first song that I've been performing you might hear me play it tonight um, I've been performing at a lot of gigs and we've done the video for it and the idea is it's, it's six songs and uh, we're going to drop three videos and then the whole EP and uh, we're just working out timing and branding and marketing right now so that'll be coming this year so if anyone's interested just uh, like the page and stuff and You'll get to, you'll get updates and posts on that, and I'd be very grateful for it. Sean, have you ever fancied being a DJ? You know, actually, I have, but the idea of just having to fill the kind of radio silence has always terrified me a little bit. So I'd love to play my own music to people, and not my own, but you know, music that I like, and see what they think. But the idea of having to do all that sort of chat in between is as good as I'm better as I'm getting with audiences. At least they're in the room, sort of. <laughs> Well, here's your opportunity to play DJ and introduce Ooh. your uh, the track that you want us to play. Um, so this is this is a track from the EP. It's not the recorded version. This is a live version I did about a year ago for uh, with some brilliant guys at Vanilla Studios, and it's it's Dark Times, which is the title track from the EP. And uh, I hope you guys like it. Some fool said, "What a nice day for the end of the world," but I won't save my breath. I'll throw my hands to the sky, watch this bubble burst Then I'll waste all the time we have left Ooh, don't we want the same thing? Or are they just playing with my head? Ooh, don't you want to change things With the time you've got left? There's a voice ringing out of her head It's sending out transmissions it says no, don't you ever dance with a devil in the pale moonlight Don't ever risk your soul on a toss of the dice Don't fear that you might fall or sugar you might But we gotta take this time and realize We're living in dark times Thrill, be it a boy or a girl or a new kind of 
pills She was tripping on a dream in the dark of the night She's ready for the heat, got kicked out of the fight Ooh, don't we want the same thing? You busy playing with my head Ooh, don't we want to change things? With this time we've got lived This voice ringing out of my head It's sending a loud transmission said Don't you ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight Don't ever risk this all on one toss of a dice If you fear that you might fall, then sugar you might We gotta take this time and realize Oh, we gotta take this time and realize Here we gotta take this time and realize We're living in dark times We're living in dark times We're living in dark times Just living in dark times Call your name now Tell me will you follow Through the fire and the flame Come on tell me if you'd follow And if I call your name I tell me will you follow Through the fire and the flame Oh tell me will you follow Oh, will you follow? Oh, won't you follow? Oh, will you follow? How will you follow? And that was Dark Times, uh, the title of the EP by Sean Harrington. And, and what's the ultimate ambition, uh, Sean? Is it to be a, a you know a musician, a star, well known? Well, what's the ambition? I think it would be what's the word? Not f like it would be ridiculous to claim that I don't want to be famous. I think the amount of people who claim that and lie about it, I think, is is, is wrong. Everyone wants that. Most humans, somewhere deep down, want validation from the people around them, and so do I. But what I really want, I guess is to be able to just survive on my own without having any boss or anyone tell me what to do with my time and what to learn and how to play it and you and have, me both and have <laughs> exactly and, and have people come and watch my music and, and like my music and feel like there's something to connect to in my music and all the time i put into picking my lyrics and, and writing those songs and stuff was worth it because it connected me with at least one more person. Tell me about the songwriting process, Sean. Um, where do you do it? How do you do it? Where do you get your ideas from? Where I do it anywhere, as long as there's a guitar and somewhere relatively quiet. Um, and sometimes not even a guitar. Sometimes I can come up with tunes and lyrics in my head and just voice memo it or record it and then work on it later. But it, it, I wish I could say, you know, a lot of songwriters, they, they'll handle something over four days maybe. I can't do that, I have to write it all in one. It either comes out fully, I even knock it together in about an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two hours of just constant playing it through and working out lyrics that work with it, or I, I leave it and I come back to it and I can't, I can't continue with it because I've lost, the, I've lost the kind of thread of what I was saying and why I was saying it and the vibe I was on when I started writing it. So it has to, it's, it's a very tricky process and if I could do it every day, I would. I have to be in a certain mindset I have to have something on my mind that wants writing about, I find. And sometimes I don't even know what I'm writing about until I finish writing about it and then it clicks just what I was talking about in my own head. Is there a theme coursing through the EP that you're just about to release? That's a really good question. Um, I think the theme to me is it's... I, I would never... I've always made it obvious to myself that the music... Uh, clear to myself the music I want to write in the least pretentious way possible I want it to be real I want it to be about real things and real feelings so and, and real to me so there's very few love songs I don't think there's a single love song on there I don't think I've ever written a proper love song 
because I, as of yet, have not fallen in love, so why should I write about it? And I think that is the theme of it. It's about things that are hopefully relatable to people, but I've experienced, because it would be dishonest to write about stuff I hadn't. So Dark Times is was written at the heart of, you know, the very beginning of the first lockdown, when a lot of terrible things seem to be happening, all kind of one after another. And uh, no matter what politics or religion you follow, it was looking a pretty bleak time. And so we wrote, I wrote Dark Times as a result of that. That was playing on my brain. And Dark Times came out, and Landslide, which is another song on the EP, is an exploration of just how... That was very much inspired by a conversation I had with my mother, who is a divorce lawyer. And it struck me that when people go looking for this elusive thing we call love, not saying I don't believe in it, of course, but they, they go into these things with a massively powerful and, and sometimes overblown expectation of what different people sh should provide and should give to each other in a relationship that might be ridiculous or might not, but it's, it, it ends up hurting them both. And that's, that's kind of that about it. That's what the album is based on. Real people, real themes and real, sometimes painful things that happen. How was the lockdown for you? Um, it was, at times, a brilliant time in my life and at the same time pretty horrible because in the first lockdown I was locked down with my elder brothers in uh, together, living together, and that was lovely. You know, we've fallen apart, n not in a bad way, but we were all doing different things, moving from, um, moving from place to place, and then now we were together, you know, we were in the same house, we were spending time together and it was it was just a great experience but then I went to university and the second lockdown hit and I was in my own apartment the same four walls for maybe three months and I found out that I was the closest to insanity I've ever been locked away from the world sort of in this cell that I'd, I'd picked for myself and it was that was that was a really dark time <laughs> ironically probably where some of the bits on the EP came from but Sean, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was oh, you're visually impaired, you're totally blind. Totally. What effect does that have on um, your performances, on how you interact with the audience? Good question. Um, it has a negative but also a positive effect, actually. Um, negative is the obvious. It's, it's hard to... So I'm in Liverpool now, and I would not be able to be here properly with all the equipment needed without the help of my, you know, my, my godfather and best friend um, who drives me and helps me set up and has been a real kind of key... Like, when I get gigs, I say, we've got a gig because it's the two of us. It's always been the two of us, and it will always be the two of us. And where, you know, we do everything together, and he helped me build this, this business, and that's that. But that is a result of blindness, unfortunately. I can't drive myself. Um, it would be very awkward to shift the gear in on my own and set up on my own. So he helps me do that. Um, and of course there are countless, you know the type of things, there are countless sort of little issues that come up that are frustrating and things like that. But we've, we've developed so many kind of methods to get around them that we're, we're doing very well on that front. And, when and you're on, on a positive way, People people are fascinated by blind people. And sometimes I find that it can be a negative thing in your normal life that you're always you might always be answering questions about it. And if you're that way inclined that can annoy you. But when people see a blind person doing what I do and hopefully doing it well, I can kind of weaponize those judgments and those feelings and those ideas that we ourselves are different and turn them into yeah we're different now you have to kind of watch me because i can do something that y you can't do better than most people who can see and when you're on stage um how do you interact with the audience how do you find that as a, a kind of like a process because interaction is kind of quite important isn't it really good question um i know i keep saying that but it's true it's it's tricky you see because at first I was terrible at it, I, I was terrified, I could, and I, I still am not the best, I can lose myself in the music, in my own song or in a cover, and the passion, I know that sounds very pretentious, but it's true, the, the passion and the, and, and the song itself, I can lose myself in that. And then suddenly when the song is over, it's like I get snapped back to where I am on my feet in front of a crowd of people, most of whom I've never met, and I realise I have to talk to them at least a little bit, and that used to be really terrifying, the really nerve-wracking part of it. 
but recently I've been taking you know um, a lot of kind of how to uh, a lot of lessons on how to communicate with crowds properly um, uh, the the theories of you know visual audio and you know kinesthetic communication with people and uh, they have been very helpful in my gigs because if you understand that people want no one wants to come and see someone fail or flop or do terribly well not no one but very few people do especially not British people because we hate that sort of we hate to watch it mm -hmm. so if you give them something to latch on to in between songs they will they will uphold you you said there that people or some people are fascinated by visual impairment so do people come up to you afterwards and, and, and start talking to you so about that so many or times what, and do I, they? I what do they say it. I yeah. welcome it I yeah. do I I have I understand blind people who get offended by having to call you know constantly answer, ask answer questions but at the same time I think it's quite a restrictive and childish view to say that you know especially if you're doing gigs in front of people you can't expect them to just would you rather they didn't answer, ask these things and just continued viewing you with clouded eyes if you pardon the pun and, and judging you then came up and found out that you are just as intelligent and just as skilled as they are no, do you think we no. have as visually impaired people do you think we have um, an obligation if you like to exactly. to, to uh, educate word. we do we do and and those of us who can should do that we should seize upon the opportunity to show just how much it doesn't bother us this thing we have and talking to people should should be should be something that we encourage, especially about our disabilities. Not to the point where it's all we talk about, but if they ask, then we should answer. We have an obligation to answer. I talk to a lot of visually impaired people who say, oh, you know, being blind is a real disadvantage in the workplace. This is your workplace. Do you think it's a it's disadvantage? It's an advantage. It's an advantage. Tell me why. Because, as I say, people are fascinated by it. And if you if you walk on stage and they're already fascinated by you, then you can use it. And if that taps into your music, do you see what I mean? I can walk into a room, and it was something my speech, uh, the guy who's been helping me learn to talk said, he's a friend of the family, and he said it when I was a kid, and it's only been affecting me for the last few years, but he says, a lot of blind people don't realise this, or they view it in a negative manner, but when you and I walk into a room with our cane, we immediately have people's attention, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> immediately. Yeah. Which is something that if you're clever enough and if you... That sounds, that sounds pretentious, but if you're, if you're switched on, you can use that. Of course. David Blunkett used it. You know, you can use that attention and magnify yourself. And that's what I try and do on stage. They're already looking at me. They're already wondering what I'm going to do because of the cane. I just have to prove that it was worth it. So you're about to go on stage now. Exactly. Any, any pre-match nerves, pre-gig nerves? There's always uh, kind of pre-gig nerves. I, you know... I'm not. I like to think I'm not arrogant enough to assume I'll blow it out the water every time. Sometimes we all have, we have duds, you know. But like, I'm I'm hopeful. Uh, Irish gigs, especially in Liverpool, this city is full of music and it's full of people who enjoy music. And uh, most of the gigs, in fact, almost every gig I've done here has had very good reception. And when you have a good crowd, your performance is, is nine times out of ten going to be uh, going to be a good one. So. Well, touching wood, he says touching his head, because others would hear. So touch, <laughs> touching wood, I hope, the, I hope the gig goes really well. I hope you smash it, as they say today. Oh, thank you. And Sean, I'm it's been really good to meet you again. To you too, man. It's it's, really uh, it was probably, what, six years ago? Uh, must... Yeah, oh, 2016. Now, now yeah. I feel old. I know. Well, <laughs> if you feel old, ancient. I'm 57, mate. So uh, uh, yes. I don't. You're, you're, you're a mere youngster. Yeah. But great. Thank you for your time. That's all. Thank you. This Cheers. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Cheers. In the Okay, that was Sean Harrington. I hope you enjoyed listening to Sean as much as I enjoyed speaking to him. Okay, then we've reached that point in the podcast where we play a track by The Vow. And I think I've chosen an absolute belter. From a rising star to falling stars. Yesterday
today.